Hey, good day and good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Please, someone to let me know if the sound is okay, if you can hear me properly, if everything is working fine. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. And I'm Sophie. I will be your host today. And welcome to IVF webinars by Egg Donation Friends. These webinars are brought to you with the help of our partners. Eisel Spende, Fertility Clinics Abroad, and Donor Conception Network. And we are here today to talk about embryos, embryo quality, and what can be done differently when your IVF failed. And the best expert to talk about embryos is the embryologist, right? So we are here together with Laura Vanos from IVF Spain, and Laura is embryologist. So uh, Laura's presentation will take around 25 minutes and then the Q&A session will follow. So if you have any questions about the embryos, take the chance and ask the expert. This webinar is also recorded, so the video from today will be available on our website tomorrow. So of course, I encourage you to uh, check it, rewatch it or uh, share it. You are free and welcome to do that. I think that's all from me for now. Laura, are you ready to start? Yes, I'm ready. Yes, I'm glad. Let's do this. Fingers crossed. And yes. So good evening to everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Sophie. Um, like you said, the topic of today is embryo quality, what to do when an IVF cycle fails. So as you all know, an IVF cycle consists of an ovarian stimulation, which will last for several days. Um, it will end up in an egg retrieval where some eggs will be collected. These eggs will be inseminated with some sperm cells. Um, once this is done, uh, the embryo will be left to develop for up to five days. Um, and after this, uh, the cycle will end, will end with an embryo transfer or with cryopreservation of embryos for subsequent transfer. Um, so this period of up to five days uh, in which the embryo stays in culture will be the main focus of this webinar. Um, so to answer the main question of this webinar, which is uh, what can we do after an IVF cycle failed? Uh, first, we thought, let's answer the question, why do IVF cycles fail? Um, so if we look at literature, there are many factors uh, that can explain an IVF failure. So for example, we have immunological factors, we have coagulation disorders, um, we have endometrial receptivity problems, uh, there are all sorts of uterine and tubal pathologies, hormonal problems, and, and the list goes on. And of of course, a reason why an IVF cycle can fail is because the embryo quality itself is not good uh, because of a poor egg quality or a poor sperm quality or because there is not, not enough uh, quantity of vitamins. So if we would block uh, all these factors into two groups, basically we could say it can be the environment surrounding the embryo which is failing. Um, or it can be the quality of the embryo itself, which is failing to produce a successful pregnancy. Um, so before we start uh, talking about the embryo quality, uh, we would like to introduce the topic by speaking a little bit about egg quality and sperm quality. So the first thing that we would like to explain is that uh, nowadays, there are not many markers for egg quality. So by this, I mean to say that when we look at an egg under a microscope, uh, there are not many signs that tell us if this egg is of good quality and if it can give rise to a viable embryo. So here you see three pictures. Um, this is how eggs look like right after the egg retrieval. You can see they are surrounded by many layers of cells. Um, these layers are called the cumulus of the egg. Um, sometimes they can already give us a little hint of whether the egg quality um, is good or not, because uh, good quality eggs usually have a very bright, translucent, and uh, very expanded cumulus, uh, whereas bad quality eggs will have a rather darkish, compact cumulus but it's not a very reliable marker. 
Um, so another important thing to know about eggs is that not all eggs are mature. Um, so when you do the echography prior to, to the egg retrieval, um, the doctor will probably tell you that you have a certain number of follicles, um, but probably there will be a decrease in the eggs that you're expecting because not all of them will be mature. So if you look at the first picture, you can see a germinal vesicle. This is basically an egg, uh, which as you can see has like some sort of little bubble inside. Um, this is the most immature form of an egg uh, and it will never be fertilized. So if you look at the second egg, um, this is a metaphase one egg. Sometimes these eggs, are, these eggs are able to mature a few hours after the egg retrieval. So sometimes it's possible to fertilize them, uh, but not always. Um, and finally, we would have the metaphase 2x, rounded in red. Uh, this is the proper mature egg, the one that we uh, aim to obtain, and the one that can be successfully fertilized. Um, on the right side of the slide, we have some examples of eggs with abnormalities. So for example, we have the first image, which is an egg with some back rows. Um, then we have an egg with a tear in some epilepsy, and then we have an egg with smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Some of these abnormalities, uh, as far as we know, are harmless, like, for example, the deer in the Phonabolutida, um, and others are linked uh, usually to bad quality in eggs, like the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. There are several other abnormalities, uh, like, for example, Yaya and X. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind to sum up about X is that, well, not all of the eggs will be mature. Among the mature eggs, uh, there might be some eggs with abnormalities, but this is also not really common. Um, some eggs with abnormalities will be excluded from the cycle if, if they are bad enough, but most of them will be inseminated. And among the good-looking um, mature eggs, it's very difficult to tell if they are of good quality or not. We, we don't really know if they can give rise to viable embryos or not. So, contrary to the X, um, we do assess the quality of a sperm sample just by looking at it under a microscope. Um, so, the main parameters which we usually look at uh, in a sperm analysis, and this will probably be familiar to you, are concentration, motility, and morphology. So, according to the World Health Organization, uh, concentration in a normal sample should be above 50 million per milliliter, progressive motility should be above 32%, and normal morphology should be above uh, or equal to 4%. Um, when there is a little deviation from this parameter, this is actually very easy to solve inside the IVF laboratory. We can just solve this uh, by using conventional sperm selection techniques plus AXC. When it's a very severe case, so um, for example, sometimes we find samples in the laboratory where it's um, barely possible to find moving sperm cells. And these kinds of samples have to be handled with a lot of care. It's uh, very important to pay close attention to the timing of the egg retrieval and to the timing of the sperm collection. Um, the XC procedure can last a long time, so sometimes it's necessary to perform it between two embryologists. And it really requires experienced staff to be successful. Um, in a routine practice in, in my clinic in IVF Spain, we also look at some molecular parameters. Um, so we also check the DNA fragmentation of sperm samples. This is basically, um, this means that there are some breaks in the genetic code of the sperm cells. We also check depoptosis, which is another molecular characteristic. And this is programmed uh, cell death. So apoptosis basically means to put it in a simple way, there are sperm cells which are moving. Um, however, they have started the process of dying. So they will be dead in a few hours. And obviously, they are not the optimal cells to fertilize the eggs. So it's normal to have some DNA fragmentation and it's normal to have some apoptotic cells. But for some people, this percentage will be increased. And if this is the case, you want to do something to remove the bad sperm cells from the sample um, in order not to fertilize the eggs with them. So 
to sum up, um, simple uh, sperm problems can be solved uh, just by conventional sperm selection techniques, such as density gradients or SRIMAP plus ICSI. Um, and then there are some very specific molecular problems um, which require different approaches. So some of these approaches may include testicular sperm extractions, um, MAX technique, PIXI technique, uh, calcium uniform, MC, and so on. So there is a wide range of pathologies and each of them has a specific treatment. So um, once we have the mature egg and we have processed the sperm sample, what will happen is that we will inseminate the eggs. Probably you're, you're familiar with the fact that this can happen through two techniques. Um, one technique is called ICSI. This means that we microinject the sperm cell directly into the egg. Um, the other technique is conventional insemination. So by this technique, uh, we will leave the egg in a droplet which contains sperm cells. Um, and then the sperm cells will naturally fertilize the egg. So in any case, whichever technique we use, um, the next day after the egg retrieval, we will come to the laboratory and first thing in the morning, we will check the eggs. And, and if they have fertilized correctly, they should look like the first picture on this slide. So basically you have the egg and inside of it, it has two little bubbles. These are called the pronuclei. What will happen from then on is then that um, the embryo will start dividing. So ideally, an embryo on day two should have around four cells. On day three, it should have around eight cells. Uh, and from then on, the embryo will keep uh, growing exponentially to 16 cells, to 32 cells, to 64 cells, until it reaches a point where it has between 100 and 300 cells. But before this increase takes place, um, what will happen is that the cells in the embryo will compact. Um, this means that there will be a point where we cannot see the borders between the cells and we can also not count them. And this is called the more or less state. And this is how the embryo looks like, like on day four of development. Um, after this, what will happen is that a little, little cavity, a little hole will start to appear in the embryo. And this cavity will grow and grow and it's filled with liquid until finally we will have um, a blastocyst. Uh, a blastocyst looks like the last image on this slide and basically is composed of two main parts. So in the inside, it has like some sort of compact mass. This is called the inner cell mass and it will become the future baby. Um, and then it has an outer layer of cells. This outer layer of cells is called the trophectoderm um, and will become the extra embryonic um, tissues and the placenta, basically the placenta. So um, here we have an example of a cycle. Uh, this patient, she had uh, six embryos. And we have chosen this cycle because it shows very well how um, classifying embryos on day two and day three is not always reliable, okay? So if, for example, we look at embryo two, on the upper side of the slide, we see how the embryos look like on day three of development. And on the lower part of the slide, we, we see how embryos look like on day five of development. So if we look at embryos two and five, we see how they look really nice uh, on day three. So embryo two has eight cells barely any fragmentation. It's really symmetrical. It's a really an A quality embryo. Embryo five looks gorgeous as well. But when we look at um, their equivalent uh, on day five, um, we can see they did not become viable blastocysts. However, if we look at embryo 1 and embryo 4, they do not look as promising at, at this fixed uh, time point as embryos 2 and 5. However, they are the ones who did become successful blastocysts. So this is important because um, in some cycles, embryos develop nicely until day 3 or until day 2. Um, but after this point, they start to grow a lot. It's a very critical point for the embryo. Um, and this is the moment when they block. So if you have been transferring embryos always on day two or day three, and you're failing to become successfully pregnant, 
you might want to give this a thought because maybe the reason why you're, you're not becoming pregnant is because you're not able to reach the blastocyst stage, even if they look promising on day two and day three. So when we heard we, we were going to present this webinar, we thought we would like to take the opportunity to throw down a common myth that seems to be widespread uh, among patients. And we very often find ourselves explaining this in, in our daily practice to the patients. And it's the fact that quantity is not the same as quality, okay? So what I mean to say by this is that um, the number of eggs that you retrieve from an egg retrieval is not always proportional to the number of blastocysts obtained. Uh, nor their quality. So, for example, one patient may have a very high number of eggs, however, she will produce very few blastocysts, which are not of top quality. And, however, another patient may have fewer eggs, uh, but most of them will become blastocysts and of nicer quality. And, and this is really like this. Uh, blastocyst rate is variable between patients. It's actually also variable between young girls who have no fertility problem, for example, uh, egg donors. And actually this blastocyst rate, so number of blastocysts uh, per egg retrieved that you find, is also variable from one cycle to the other one in one same, same patient. So it can be that in one cycle uh, you produce a certain number, a certain percentage of blastocysts, and that in the next cycle this percentage goes up and down. So some patients seem to be, um, some patients are very uh, discouraged um, when they don't retrieve enough eggs. Um, and they, they seem to think um, it's impossible that they will become pregnant, that their chances are, are really low. But this is really not always the case. Uh, all you need to become pregnant is one top quality embryo, not 30 good quality embryos. Uh, regular quality embryos. So um, another point that we would like to make is, is that embryos are usually given grades, such as A, B, C, and D. Um, it's a general consensus in every clinic everywhere in the world that A and B quality embryos will always, always be transferred and cryopreserved. Um, whereas the quality embryos will never be transferred nor cryopreserved. But when it comes to C quality embryos, um, this actually includes different subtypes of embryos, different situations. So not all C quality embryos are the same. Um, and what we have to keep in mind is that embryo scoring systems are a simplification. This is important. So they are important um, and they are useful, the grading systems, to rank embryos within a cycle. So it will be your way of knowing which embryo we should transfer in first place, in second place, in third place. And they are also useful to explain embryo qualities to patients. But the reality is a little bit more complex. Um, and different laboratories and even uh, operators within the same laboratory may be more or less strict uh, when classifying embryos. Um, sometimes we have patients who come up to us in the laboratory and they tell us, look, please, please freeze my C quality embryos. Um, because you know, I have a friend or, or I heard about someone who became pregnant with a C quality embryo. And uh, we are uh, very aware that you can become pregnant with a C quality embryo. We, this happens every day. And we are also aware of how valuable every chance is uh, for a patient. But you have to keep in mind uh, that the C score is a simplification and not all C quality embryos are the same so sometimes it might be that they are not worth uh, to be transferred or to be cryopreserved. So once we have a blastocyst um, not all blastocysts have the same quality and this is the same as saying that um, blastocysts have different implantation potentials um, we could categorize um, blastocysts uh, or embryos in three different ways. So the classical way is based in looking at the embryo at a fixed time point. Um, this is called morphological assessment. 
And in Atlasis, we will look at the true factor and quality, we will look at the inner cell mass quality, and we will look at the expansion of the inner cell mass like I said, is a future baby, the prefer with the future placenta, the outer layer cells. And the expansion degree um, means how big did the embryo become, how far evolved is it. Um, but nowadays, more and more, uh, we are basing our assessment in uh, time-lapse techniques. So some incubators, uh, time-lapse incubators have cameras inside, and these cameras take take pictures of the embryos every five minutes. So in the end, we have a video recording of all the embryos uh, of a patient in one cycle. Um, and by this, we can have a more dynamic view of the embryo and we can study how it developed from beginning to end and not just at a fixed time point. So this is a very useful technique. Additionally, uh, one thing is important to know is that not all embryos are genetically normal. So embryos have errors. Uh, in particular, they have chromosomal abnormalities. Um, this can be tested in the clinic by pre-implantation genetic testing. And well, lastly, there are some, some couples which might have um, a disease, which uh, their, their sons and daughters can inherit. Um, and they will perform. They will perform PGD on their embryos um, to test if they are healthy or not healthy, and transfer only the healthy ones. So to start with the morphological quality, to uh, the assessment at a fixed time point. In the upper part, in the upper row of this slide, you can see embryos with different expansion degrees. So the first image is the image of a very early blastocyst. Next to it, you can see an embryo which expanded a little bit more. On the third image is a fully expanded blastocyst. And the last image is a hatching blastocyst. Hatching blastocysts, um, I will make a little comparison, but human embryos are like chicken eggs. So they have a shell around them. And around day six, they break the shell and they come out of the shell in order to implant. So this is what the embryo in the last image is doing. And it is uh, nowadays generally accepted that embryos which have um, a high expansion degree, so they are fully expanded, will implant better than embryos which are still in an early state. So in the second row of the slide, uh, we see embryos which have different qualities of inner cell masses. The first inner cell mass is an A-quality inner cell mass. It is really compact uh, and big. The second image is a B-quality inner cell mass. It is, it is rather too small. The third image is of a C-quality inner cell mass. Why? Because it's barely visible. And the last image would correspond to a B-quality inner cell mass. Um, this is because it shows some degeneration signs and uh, it is really disgregated. This is a very bad sign. So in the last row, uh, we have embryos which are graded according to their trophoderm quality. The first image would be an A-quality trophoderm. Um, it is fully packed, forming a very cohesive uh, layer. The next image would be a B-quality trophoderm. Uh, with fewer cells, not so cohesive. Uh, and the third image would be um, a C-quality trophoderm. It has very few cells which are not cohesive at all, and they are really large. Uh, and finally, we would have a D-quality trophoderm because it has degeneration signs, so dying signs, basically, and it's really disgregated. Um, so, like I explained, time-lapse is a powerful technique that is being used nowadays to assess embryo quality. And it is based on the fact that incubators have cameras inside which record the embryos continuously. So the main advantage I would say is that you can look at the embryos any time of the day uh, just by opening the computer and opening the screen. So you do not need to open the incubator, take the embryo out, look at it under the microscope and place it back. So you do not disturb its stable culture conditions because incubators obviously have special culture conditions. Um, and if you're always opening and closing the lid, 
uh, they will be disturbed. So this is the main advantage of, of time-lapse system. Um, additionally, well, it has individual patient chambers and it allows us to perform a morphokinetic analysis of the embryo. So um, when embryos are in time-lapse, we can study their times of divisions and we can study if they have, for example, direct cleavages, um, if their cell cycles are synchronic, uh, how much their cell, their cell cycles last. And this allows us to predict the implantation potential of the embryos and to select the best embryos for transfer. So lastly, uh, the third tool we had to assess an embryo quality was PET, pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, and this is based on the fact that not all embryos are normal. Embryos have errors, genetic errors. And the percentage of abnormal embryos uh, increases with age, with maternal age. Um, so when you transfer an abnormal embryo, in most cases, um, it will not implant. So it will just be a wasted transfer. If they do implant, they will lead to a miscarriage. Um, and in a few percentage of cases, um, the, the pregnancy will go on, but the baby will have the disease. So the tool that we have in the laboratory, the process that we follow to try to solve this problem is um, when the embryo reaches day five, day six, uh, we extract a few cells from the embryo. Um, we extract the DNA in these cells, we amplify it, and through next generation sequencing, we, we sequence this DNA. Uh, and when we look at it, we are able to tell if this embryo has the right number of chromosomes or if it has some deletion or duplication and so on. So we'll know which embryos are healthy and which ones are not. Um, the value of this, on one hand, it has a diagnostic value. So you will know if your embryos are normal or not, and this will allow you to know how you need to move forward. Um, but basically the main described benefit of PDT is that it will reduce, reduce time to pregnancy. Why? Because you will avoid um, useless transfers. You will not transfer embryos which are not going to implant or which are going to miscarry anyway. So as a conclusion from this webinar, from everything we said, um, if you would need to decide how to go on in a future cycle, um, you need to know which problem you need to address. Um, so you need to know if uh, the problem of your failure lies on the embryo quality or if it lies elsewhere in the embryo environment. The top technology that is available nowadays to evaluate embryo quality includes culturing embryos until day five or day six, using time-lapse technique and uh, performing uh, blastocyst biopsy, performing PDT. Um, at least if you perform these techniques, you will know fully uh, to the extent that science nowadays allows uh, the quality of your embryos. If after this, you can discard uh, that the embryo quality is a factor for you, you will be able uh, to focus um, more on the, on, on the environment of the embryo and you will be able to search for medical solutions. Um, so that will be a little bit the conclusion of this webinar. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions about anything uh, related, I will be more than happy to answer them. Um, or if you have a longer question, please feel free to uh, send your question to our corporate email contact at ivfspain.com. Thank you, Laura, for uh, telling us all those interesting <laughs> things about embryos and embryology. This is like, wow, interesting thing. And you have like really pretty interesting work, I think. Um, we have some questions, so we will uh, start with the questions if you are ready. Okay, so we will take the first question and this question is I had a 3BB transferred in April and this failed. I have a 3BB and two 5BBs two frozen with IVF Spain. Will the grading be the same when they have thought? Yes, the grading will be the same when they have thought. So in this case probably we will transfer the 5BB's the embryos. 
Yes, because they are more expanded. Uh, probably they are from day six, frozen at day six. And that is why we transferred the three BB in first place. Um, but yes, they will be the same degree. Um, according to statistics, the um, quality of the embryos does not change after we cryopreserve them through vitrification. Thank you a lot for explaining this. And we will then jump to the next question. I had an embryo frozen, which had irregular cell division from one to three cells, but went on to form a beautiful blastocyst. Can you give a view of implantation potential and possibility of this leading to a healthy baby in a frozen embryo transfer cycle? Yes, so that's a good question. In the past, um, we used to believe that when there was an, uh, a division from one to three cells, this was quite catastrophic. Uh, but we ha what we have seen in recent years and what studies are saying lately, and, and we have also seen it, um, is that when these embryos reach the blastocyst state, what usually happens is that they leave the six cells out of the embryo. And we have seen that when we perform PGT on these embryos, they are genetically normal. So uh, this means that the embryos have some sort of repair mechanism so they can tell that maybe one cell in the embryo um, is not healthy and they just leave it out. So the rest of the embryo will be healthy and it actually has a good implantation potential. We will then take a look on the next one. What is the link between morphological quality and likely genetic quality? For example, is a 5AA more likely to be genetically normal than, say, a 4B? Um, sometimes we are surprised um, because we have embryos which are AA quality, you know, and they, they look perfectly fine. And however, they are the, the embryos of the pool which are not genetically normal. So there is not always a correlation. And in fact, if, you, if, if it's a very severe chromosomal problem, so if a lot of chromosomes are, are altered, this will show in the embryo, early embryo development. But if, for example, you have a trisomy of um, chromosome 21, um, even when you have a fetus, uh, you know, in the six month of development, it will be difficult of, to detect. So imagine an embryo which is just five days old. It will not show so easily on the outer, outer side. Thank you. Mm, we will take the next question. We have it uh, here. Is there more success rates with frozen or fresh embryo transfer using donor eggs? The first transfer in a cycle has a higher implantation uh, potential than the other uh, embryo transfers. But you have to keep in mind that the first embryo which is transferred, so the fresh embryo transfer, is the best embryo of the pool. Because we select uh, the best embryo to be transferred in the first transfer, the fresh transfer. Um, so the ones which are transferred uh, afterwards, the cryopreserved embryos, are the ones which did not have the best quality. So this might, it's true that the first transfer does have a little bit more implantation potential, but it could also be because of this. Thank you a lot, Laura, for explaining this as well. Uh, we will then take a question about PGT, and we have two very similar questions, so I will display it one by one, and you will uh, answer uh, the two of them at once. Would you recommend PGT testing for IVF with donor eggs? And very similar one, is it necessary to perform PGT on donor eggs blastocysts? Um, so that's a good question. And the thing is, um, if you actually look, look at the euploid rate described for egg donors, I, I think we saw on the slide it was around 60%. Um, so 100% necessary, no, but it will save time up to pregnancy. And uh, for some people, you have to think, what is the value? How important is it for you? How, how hard is it for you to go through the disappointment 
of a unsuccessful transfer? How much time, um, money and, and mental energy do you waste on this? Um, so, yeah. Thank you for your answer. And we will jump to the next question. If the embryo doesn't form a blastocyst until day six, is it more likely to be genetically abnormal? I think it's a little bit more likely to be genetically abnormal if, it's, if it has a slower pace, uh, but it's a little bit con contradictory evidence. Yes, and then we will have the next question. Hi, are you against day three transfer? It's very confusing understanding the pros and cons of day three or their day five. So if you just can maybe give us a little more explanation. Uh, thank you for that. So it's a personal decision. So for some patients, I can understand that they decide to transfer their embryos on day two or day three. For example, if they have very few embryos, um, but what we see regularly in the clinic, so patients who come sometimes to our clinic, um, they've had like 5, 10, 15 transfers on day two um, without a successful result. And when they perform a, a single cycle, leaving their embryos to day five, uh, maybe it turns out that from all the eggs, um, although they develop until day two or day three, only a few of them reach day five. Um, so you can waste a lot of time transferring embryos of day two or day three. Um, and if you do not become pregnant, you will never know the reason. And maybe they're just not able to reach the blastocyst state or the blastocyst rate is really low. So definitely um, leaving embryos to day five doesn't harm them. Uh, and you will have a lot more information and you will waste less time. Thank you for your answer. We have um, a little related question, so maybe you would like to add anything or uh, give us more details. And this question is, I have two grade three embryos on day three. However, it stopped to develop last stage and I lost the chance for embryo transfer. Please advise if it's worth doing embryo transfer on day three instead of blastocyst stage. Thanks. Um, look, if, if the embryos are not reaching day five in the laboratory, they will not reach day five inside of your uterus. And um, this is a common question and something that, that patients wonder a lot about, but it's really like this. And uh, many studies have, have shown this by cumulative light birth and if, if it doesn't develop to day five inside the laboratory, it will not develop to day five inside of you. So um, you will not become pregnant just by transferring the embryos on day three if they're not able to reach the blastocyst state. Thank you for your explanation, Laura. We will take a look for the next question. Would transferring an embryo with irregular cell division but that made it to blastocyst at the same as transferring embryos with normal cell division put a risk the normal embryos. With transferring an embryo with irregular cell divisions, um, well, um, I, won, I once read an article uh, which I thought I had a funny title and it said, um, it's better to be alone than with bad company. Um, so to transfer one blastocyst of good quality with one blastocyst of bad quality, uh, it's better maybe to transfer alone the embryo with good quality. But that said, even if an embryo has irregular divisions, um, like I think I explained in a previous question, it might be that the embryo has uh, correction mechanisms. So it might still be that the embryo with irregular divisions um, has a good quality. In any case, we do not really encourage uh, transferring two, two blastocysts at the same time. Um, so I would just go for uh, transferring the normal embryo at once. Thank you for recalling this very true saying. Mm -hmm. We will then take a look at the next question. 
which is, are there any studies to suggest that a woman's BMI impacts the egg quality and therefore the embryo quality? Yes, 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 there are, there are. And um, <laughs> actually sometimes uh, when patients uh, go visit their IVF doctors, the first recommendation is lifestyle change uh, following a diet. Um, because this can definitely have an influence um, in pregnancy rates, egg quality, and so on. It's more a medical question. Probably a doctor can give you a better answer, but yes, it does have an influence. Yes, and your confirmation may be not so good information to know that, but thank you for your answer. And we will then take a look for the next question. And this will be this one. I had two cavitating blasts transferred in May, good and top quality. This failed. I also had two failed FET last year from previous successful cycle in 2013. I am now considering a donation. I am 42. I collected six eggs in May, which cavitating only. Is this sign of poor egg quality? Um... Yes, it does seem um, like a likely sign of um, poor egg quality. Um, but maybe at your age, uh, what is lacking here is the PGT. Because um, it could be that the embryos, the embryos seem to reach uh, blastocyst stage. If these were day five embryos, uh, probably at day six, they would have been fully expanded. I don't know what their morphological quality was. Um, but also at 42, it's very likely that the egg uh, quality has an influence in this. So you would need um, many embryo transfers to have a euploid embryo, which would make you pregnant. Thank you for your explanation. Laura and um, we actually have a question which is related to the BMI topic so I think that we will come back to it as it seems to be important so can BMI be too low? Again this is a more a medical question um, so I could give you my opinion um, but probably a, a doctor can give you a better well-informed answer um, I do think BMI can be too low for a pregnancy, yes. Yes, and thank you for adding this. We will then take the question. For my first transfer, I had two 3BBs and one 5BB. I was uh, first was being left for review until day six and turned out to be 5BB. You mentioned on my previous question that on the next transfer you would use the 5BB, but earlier you said that the best quality would be transferred. So why was the 5BB not used originally? Uh, is a 5BB better than a 3BB? I had two 3BBs and one 5BB. One was being left for review until day six and turned out to be 5BB. Um... Yeah, but the 5BB was of day six, uh, you say. So um, the 3BB would have been a 5BB on day six. But the thing is, this embryo had one more day of culture. Uh, so now we have the embryos when they have had one more day of culture. But the 3BB was a 3BB on day five. It would have been a 5BB on day six. And um, here I'm lacking the, the time lapse information. So it, it might have been that the embryos were in time lapse, uh, that we were using this system, uh, and that we had some additional information about the embryos, so about their cell divisions. Um, so that could be an explanation. But right now, if I have a 5BB and a 3BB, which are already cryopreserved, just knowing this about them and not knowing anything more, um, because it might be that we know something more, uh, we would first transfer the 5PB because it has a higher degree of expansion. 
thank you a lot for this explanation. And as it is a very specific specific question, I also put in the chat section our uh, email address. If you like to, um, yeah, forward this question to IVF Spain, you can always do that. Throw us an email, and we will uh, send everything to IVF Spain tomorrow morning. Feel free to do that, uh, and we can now take the next question. Uh, sorry for joining a bit late, but I had good graded 6 AA and 5 BC embryos on day 5. However, PGS showed abnormal chromosomes on both embryos. What can be done to improve quality if there is any chance? Um... This question we get a lot, um, and I think it's more medical. So I'm pretty sure the doctors will know better how to answer you because um, sometimes they decide to change the stimulation protocols, for example, uh, to try to increase the embryo quality. Um, but from a laboratory perspective, unless there is um, some sperm pathology that is involved or, or um, um, some fertilization problem, there is not so much that we can do just by knowing this about the UPLG. Uh, because, well, women are born with the number of eggs that they have. Um, so the UPLG rate um, is a little bit determined by age. Thank you for your answer and as well for the question. Mm, we will take a look for the next question. Will adenomyosis and endometriosis have impact to embryo implantation? And if yes, what is the treatment for this? Um, so this is really a medical question. <laughs> so I wish I could help you, but uh, this should be answered by a doctor. And I'm an embryologist, a biologist. So um, just feel free to, to send this, in, this question. I think all questions will be forwarded to our medical team as well. Yeah, uh, so we will course. be able to give you a proper answer later on. Uh, we can then take a look for the next question. Can a small amount of alcohol consumption before and during IVF treatment affect egg quality and transfer? It's hard to say. I, I would not know how to give you an answer. Uh, when patients tell us what should we do, uh, we just say general uh, improving general lifestyle and it's true that um, drinking can have an influence in sperm quality for example um, but in particular concerning egg quality and the transfer I, I would not know which answer to give you thank you for giving us uh, an answer for this question and we will uh... <laughs> The difference between PGT and PGD? So um, in PGT what we are testing is the number of chromosomes and if these chromosomes are complete so for example if they have any deletion or any duplication um, PGD is really specific so we're checking a single gene and um, so PGD is only used for couples who already know which disease in particular they want to check. Um, and PET is used for everybody because uh, we all might have, uh, we all might produce chromosom chromosomally abnormal embryos. So PET is, is shown chromosomal em embryos such as um, trisomies of chromosome 21, for example, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, common syndromes. And PED is only testing if you have one particular disease. Yes, and thank you for the question and your answer as well. And the next one for you is this one. If embryos stop to grow on day three, is it caused by egg or sperm quality? Thanks. Um, so there are some cases where, where all the embryos stop to develop at day three. And this can be due to sperm quality uh, because uh, the embryonic genome starts to activate um, around this point. So if, if the embryos always block, particularly at day three, 
it can be that it is due to supreme quality. Thank you. Mm, we will have the next question. If in PGT the result of thropoderm is abnormal, can the ICM be still normal and lead to a healthy baby? Yes, this is possible. Um, so there are many studies about this. And in a low percentage of cases, um, it could be that the placenta is not representative um, of the ICM, uh, but it's a very low percentage of cases. But yes, it's possible. Yes, thank you for the answer. We have the next question. Do you have a view on why a genetically tested normal embryo doesn't implant? Um, so if a genetically normal embryo doesn't implant, you have to think that you did everything possible um, regarding the embryo. So you can exclude the embryonic factor. So probably there is something else uh, which is preventing implantation. So it might be something related to your uterus, uh, an immunological problem, something like this. Implantation window. Uh, sorry, yes, because I started to speak and if you wanted to add anything, feel free to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, so we were taking the next question, right? Is IVF Spain doing PGT testing on site? How many days does it take to get the results back? Um, so when we perform PGT, it takes like uh, 15 days to get back the results uh, and to know if the embryos are chromosomally normal or not. Yes, and then we will take a look for the question, which is, which one is the best predictor of implantation? ICM or throfectoderm? Throfectoderm is the best predictor for implantation. Yes. Um, yes, if you, if you have a throfectoderm of quality A and inner cell mass, of, of the throfectoderm is the most important. Yes, we are grateful for your explanation. And then uh, we will jump to the next question. Can you recommend any supplements, etc., to improve eggs? Um, so again, that's a more medical question. So we will forward your question to our medical team so that I can give you the right answer. Thank you a lot. We will take a look for the next question. Does ICSI has impact to the embryo quality of IVF? No, it does not. Um, we know this for sure um, because in our clinic, sometimes in egg donation programs, what we do is to fertilize half of the eggs uh, through ICSI and half of the eggs uh, through conventional IVF. And what we see in the results is that they basically have the same development. We see no influences. Um, very often the best quality embryo comes from ICSI and not from IVF. So we do not see um, any, any, any difference. And we do this very often in egg donation cycles. And thank you again for your answer. The next question which I have for you is, I have had an IVF cycle where the follicles grew in different batches, so there was only three mature eggs to at egg collection. What can be done to try and ensure consistent follicle growth? I used noristerone and overall patches per cycle, and I was wondering if the ostrog ostrogen in the overall patches could be responsible for the inconsistent follicle growth. Um, so this question is really related to stimulation, to the ovarian stimulation. Uh, so we take note of the question and uh, we will try to give you a proper answer when we can forward it to the doctor. Yes, and we will then take a look for the question, which is, I think, more about embryology. What things will you advise to improve egg and sperm quality? Um, generally speaking, of course, healthy lifestyle. Um, for sperm, there are, there are uh, many things that are described, like antioxidants, um, 
not wearing too tight underwear, um, not smoking, um, not drinking too much. Um, so um, basically a healthy lifestyle and uh, also, uh, like we said, too high, too low BMI. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we are having two more questions. Laura, are we ready to take those questions? Yes. <laughs> so, which is more important in the embryo quality, the first or the second letter, like 5AB or 5BA? Which embryo is of better quality? So, the most important is a true factor there, like we said, which is the second letter. Um, so actually the 5BA would be considered to have more implantation potential than a 5AB. Um, however, 5AB and 5BA, they are really close one to each other. And if you remember one of my slides, um, embryo rating systems are a simplification. So an A grade sometimes might be really close to a B grade. It depends. Laura and all your slides will be available tomorrow in the recording of today's webinar. So just we can encourage you to take a look tomorrow on Laura's slides again. And as I said, we will take the last question, uh, which is a little longer, but how we have transferred NGS tested unemployed embryo last year however it resulted as biochemical pregnancy which shows that it has implanted at some level we are told that the embryo didn't have enough energy still not satisfied with the explanation how will you explain it thanks so the embryo did implant in fact if you have a positive hce so it's a biochemical uh, pregnancy and I guess your doctor was trying to explain um, how the embryo did manage to um, go through this implantation potential but did not manage to complete uh, the whole process that was necessary for the embryo to keep growing um, and and follow all the first embryo embryological steps that embryos take uh, during embryogenesis uh, what the reason is for the biochemical pregnancy, I will not be, not be able to tell. There are many reasons why um, biochemical pregnancies may occur. Um, but again, like we said last time, um, the, the embryo was euploid. I guess you mean euploid. Um, so you could at least exclude the embryonic factor. Thank you a lot for your answer as, uh, as well as for the question and thank you for all the answers you gave us today and all the knowledge uh, this evening. I have a shout out for you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your answers. Uh, if by any chance any uh, of your questions uh, was left without an answer just throw us an email on the email address which i will put again uh, in the chat section and we will forward everything uh, to ivf uh, spain tomorrow uh, one more thank you <laughs> and so we uh, will be finishing our today's webinar thank you a lot Laura, thank you a lot for your presentation, for your time, you. answers. Yes, uh, it was a pleasure to uh, host you here today. Uh, we are, of course, uh, planning the next IVF webinars with IVF Spain, and those are the dates of upcoming IVF webinars with IVF Spain. Laura, do you want to add anything? Any final words? If you want to do that, please. You can have a time now. Um, just thank you for inviting us. And like Sophie said, if you have if you have any remaining questions, um, just feel free to contact us, and uh, we will get in touch with you to answer your questions. 
Yes, indeed. And of course, we would like to encourage you also to stay up to date with us and please subscribe also to our YouTube channel where you will find also the video from today's webinar and uh, follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Follow IVF Spain on Instagram and Facebook. They have great content there also. So we hope to meet you uh, in the social media also. And of course, it will be a great pleasure to have you all here next week on Tuesday, same place, same time. I hope it will be also a great evening. And for today, thank you, Laura, one more time. Thank you, everybody, for your time, for your attendance, and have a good day or good night, wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.